I had a session this week with someone I hadn't seen since before my medical leave. Before I go too far into this, let me say this is not about to be one of those tell-all moments where I use a client as a case study to highlight my skills as some kind of a therapy god. There are plenty of books out there written just that way. This person has actually given me permission to tell her story, and she jokes frequently that some of the things she says will end up in my book because they're funny or pithy or mordant or in some way a perfect combination of memorable and unflinchingly accurate. Plus, I like the fact she thinks I'm going to write a book. She doesn't know that I've started it. I just haven't finished it. She said I can fully identify her because she's proud of the work she's done over the years. So what I'm sharing here, I do have permission to share, even though I'm not actually sharing that much or anything identifiable. Now that I've gotten that caveat out of the way, I'll finish the story. She came to session this week quite distraught over some of the revelations she had while we were apart. Specifically, she had six weeks to reflect on her understanding of romantic relationships and why she has failed so miserably over the past six years of her adult life. I'm not saying that to be judgmental. That's actually how she described it. She talked about all the things she knew about relationships in general and how they ended up shaping her choices. As a cishet woman of privilege in the South, she observed that some of her choices in male mates were based on how they catered to the male gaze of the people around them, a phenomenon she attributes to a particularly Southern view of patriarchy and how men determine the worth of a relationship by the views of the men around them. Friends, fraternity brothers, work colleagues, family members, country club, golfing buddies, and so on. If they envy you for your trophy wife, then you made a good choice. She chose some guys because she knew how to meet this standard and how to present as a trophy. She also reflected on how women, and what she thinks is especially true of Southern women, how women are taught and conditioned to treat men so they don't leave them and diminish a woman's value because she's somehow tainted or unworthy or used up or not good enough to be kept. She then connected that to viewing relationships as a measure of worth in general. If a woman is partnered, she's more worthy than a single woman. And as a woman who wants to be partnered and worthy, she invested more into herself during times when she was tied to somebody. She went to the gym more. She ate better. She dressed better. She did things that maybe weren't always all that important to her, but would be important to keeping a man. Setting aside all the patriarchy and misogyny in those thought processes, and my own belief that this is not unique to Southern culture or really even female identifying folks in general, I was quite proud of her cogent observations about where these thoughts originated. First is her family of origin. These were the things that they told her throughout her childhood and preparation for college and adulthood. The second source of these thoughts is media representations, the things we see on TV, in movies, in magazines, in books, and our social media feeds. Don't misunderstand. I do not think all of our sociocultural influences are toxic and steering us towards lives of abject misery. There's a lot of that out there, but there's also a lot of really good messaging. We choose how we want to curate those inputs. She's made a very specific choice, like most of us. The more I thought about these origins of her distorted and distressing thoughts, the more I was brought back to schema therapy. Schema therapy is a type of therapy that targets schemas a term used in a specific clinical context to describe patterns of thinking that can cause us to engage in unhealthy behaviors and maybe even cause us to struggle with relationships in adulthood. To understand how this therapy works, we have to really understand schemas. A schema is a knowledge structure that helps us interpret and understand the world around us. Schemata, the plural of schema, are a method of organizing information that hopefully allows our brains to work more efficiently. Don't worry, I'm going to skip the lecture on cognitive science and heuristic learning. The crux of it is this. We get exposed to something. That something helps us interpret the world in that moment. We file it away for later. The more we do that, the more organized systems we create to help us navigate our daily world day after day. Schemas can be changed and reconstructed throughout the lifespan, and that's a good thing. Here's an example. Imagine I'm reading a picture book to my son at three years old. There is a picture of a dog, something he's never seen before because we're a cat family. This is a new thing. So he enters this state of disequilibrium, which is a fancy term for a lack of stability in his knowledge base. 
something isn't making sense because it's new. So he looks at the picture. He sees a small creature with ears and four legs and fur and a tail. And he assimilates this knowledge, this information. Now he knows what a dog is. And he returns to a state of equilibrium. But the next day on TV, he sees a different kind of a dog. This isn't the border collie he saw in the picture book. This is a chihuahua. So he's confused. He thinks it might be a dog because it has four legs and a tail. He's starting to generalize. So he points and says, doggy? But in a questioning tone. Disequilibrium again. I say, yes, good job. And he integrates this new dog into his memory. He's creating a schema, a knowledge base of dog. The more dogs he sees, the more his schema changes and grows. Pretty basic, right? Here's another one. Think about a table. What is a table? When you close your eyes and picture a table, you probably have a specific image that comes to mind. Maybe it's a table in your house, or one you saw in a store, or maybe it's just a generic looking image and you really don't have any idea where it came from. But what are you seeing? What are you thinking? I'm guessing when I say table, you think of a piece of furniture that has a flat top and one or more legs, providing a level surface where you can put things. That's actually more than one schema. The first is a higher level schema of furniture, or objects intended to support various human activities like eating or sleeping or working or storage. Within that schema, there's another level, table. Now we have schemata, multiple schemas organizing thought patterns. But what if I throw something in there that doesn't quite fit? I really enjoy good bourbon, which is aged in new charred oak barrels, very specific requirements to be bourbon. After the minimum two years of aging in those charred oak barrels, the bourbon is distilled and the barrel is discarded. Some places reuse the barrels for aging wine or beer, but I wanted to use that barrel in a different way. I want it to be a table. So I order one with a table top on it. Now it's not a barrel anymore. It's a table. But it doesn't look like a table. It's got a flat surface and there's a support structure, but it's not a leg or a post. So how do I know it's a table? Because I put something on it and my brain said, ah, flat surface that you can use as furniture, like a traditional table. Now it's a table my schema of a table evolved. Right about now, you're asking yourself, what does this cognitive psychology lecture, which he said he wasn't going to do, have to do with his client or his own journey? Well, here it is. I've talked about all the things that I know, all the things I've been taught, all the things I've experienced, how I've been taught and trained and conditioned to see the world. But when I break those events into smaller pieces, maybe even their smallest pieces, I get to the schema level and I start thinking about the basic building blocks of my framework of knowledge. When I think about a family, my initial visualization is mom, dad, four kids, because that was my family. I don't think about mom, mom and dad divorcing, mom and a stepdad, dad and a stepmom, two brothers and a half sister. That wasn't my family. I know it's a family, but it's not my go-to understanding. When I think of marriage, I think about my parents. Why? Because that's what I know. A thing I say a lot with clients is that we do what we know and we know what we've seen. So what I know of marriage is my parents' marriage because that's what I saw. But if you listen to anything I've said before or know much about my family, you know that my parents didn't always have the healthiest and happiest marriage. So what I intuitively know about marriage, not the best. My client, what she knows about relationships from what she's seen is that they aren't always about love and connection. They're about status and security and value and advancement. They're competitive, like some Darwinian version of relationship survival of the fittest. She started seeking out potential partners that fit that schema. She invested a lot of time in guys she didn't actually like or respect or admire or love because they came from the right family, had the right background, worked in the right professions, went to the right school, knew the right people valued the accumulation of status and wealth. Things that don't seem to really matter that much to her, but she was taught and conditioned and continually encouraged to move in that direction and to make sure she kept whoever she landed that fit that bill. That's her schema or schemata of a relationship. And she's in significant disequilibrium right now 
because that doesn't match with other things she's learning through exposure and experience. I thought about my most basic schemas, what marriage looks like because I've observed one specific marriage for nearly 50 years, what sex looks like because I've had over 40 years of exposure to not healthy ideas about sex as validation and control, what emotional bonding looks like because I didn't always have that to know what it is or how to do it. What sharing looks like, because I grew up in a family of secrets and entered a vocation where I'm a professional secret keeper. So many of my struggles over the past two decades of my life, and what I'm working on now with this unconventional intensive treatment plan, turn out to be the product of thousands of schema and schemata that are a major determinant of how I think feel, behave, and interact socially. Things I've long accepted as truths about the world, despite negative consequences and lots of evidence to the contrary. All this work I've been doing to get to a happier and healthier place has been about more than just modifying my behavior or taking a pill. It's been about evaluating those basic building blocks of what I know about myself and my place in the world. Some blocks are good and they need to be fortified. Some are damaged and they need to be repaired, and some just need to be hit with a wrecking ball so I can rebuild with better blocks. Yep. I just liken my cognitive processes to constructing a building. Or, if you know me well, playing with Legos. The thing I'm learning about this process, which is mirrored by my client's experience, is that this is a slow process, or at least slower than I would like. It requires a great deal of introspection and evaluation to understand why I think and feel and act the way that I do. It requires a great deal of commitment to evolving or replacing those schemas, those basic building blocks, so that I can be built up to my best, strongest, happiest, healthiest, most actualized self. And it has to be broken down into those basic building blocks. That's the foundation of it all. That's the foundation of who I am and what I know and what I do. It's a lot to consider. It may be a lot to address, but the thing about making these changes is, well, it's a lot like building a snowman. Not that we do a lot of that here in Texas. You start small. You start with that one little ball of snow, and you keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it until you have the layers of a body, and then you accessorize it. That carrot nose, the coal eyes and mouth, the stick arms, maybe a fun sweater. Yes, a sweater. He's cold. Maybe a jaunty hat and my favorite Burberry scarf. Just kidding, nobody borrows that scarf. The process starts small, and the more you go, the more you build, the more you like, the more success you have. It's an iterative process. We keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Because every minute is a chance for me to keep working towards the best version of myself. That's what I'm doing, that's what my client is doing. It's a process. Growth always is. That's where I'm at today. I'll check in tomorrow.